Welcome to episode 27. This is a review for exam number four. Uh, and uh, in this episode, we've been talking about matrices, applications of matrices for solving systems of equations and other things. Uh, let's go to our first graphic here and look at some of the ideas you need to be familiar with before you take this test. Uh, first of all, you should be prepared to solve problems uh, similar to those that we've been discussing in class and those that have been assigned for homework. Uh, on, this on, in this, on this exam, you can't use a calculator, uh, uh, so uh, I'll try to keep the numerical computations fairly simple when we reduce matrices uh, so that a calculator won't be that significant. Uh, as usual, you can't use notes, uh, you can't use your text. Uh, the scratch paper that you're given with your test will have to be turned in, even the paper that you don't use. Um, and finally, we suggest that you show all your work to get partial credit in case you miss a problem. Uh, we try to be fairly generous with the partial credit, but if there's no work shown and you just have a wrong answer, then we don't have much option except to just count off full credit. So keep that in mind when you're taking the test. Okay, well let's go to episode 22 and look at some of the ideas we want to review from that. Uh, first of all, you want to be able to use Gaussian elimination with back substitution to solve systems of linear equations. Now, before we uh, look at the second item there, I think we should work an example of a problem with Gaussian elimination with back substitution to remind you how this goes. So I have an example here that I've made up uh, that I'll solve using this method. The problem goes like this. x minus y plus 3z is equal to 4 and x plus 2y minus 2z is equal to 10, and then 3x minus y plus 5z is 14. Uh, now, I want to solve this system of equations uh, using matrix methods. In particular, I want to use the Gaussian method, the Gaussian method with back substitution, Gaussian elimination. Uh, and you know, that means we're going to convert this to a matrix, and then there are only three things I can do to the matrix that will um, allow me to keep the solution while simplifying the system. And that is I can interchange two rows. Um, I can uh, multiply any row by a non-zero constant. It's got to be non-zero, of course. And then I can add a multiple of one row to another row. So uh, those are called the three elementary row operations. So here's how, we, here's how we do this. First of all, I abbreviate this with a matrix where I only show the coefficients and the constants. That would be 1, minus 1, 3, and 4. 1, minus 1, 3, and 4. And then 1, 2, negative 2, 10. And then 3, 1, uh, 3, negative 1, 5, 14. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to alter this system of equations so that I get 1's along the main diagonals and I get zeros below that. Well, I already have a 1 here, so I think I'm ready to get a 0 below that 1 and a 0 uh, at the very bottom. So I'm working on the first column only here. So what I'm going to do is take uh, row 2 and add on negative 1 times row 1. And also, I'll take row 3 and add on negative 3 times row 1. That's a negative 3 there. But I'm not going to change row 1, so I can rewrite that. 1, negative 1, 3, and 4. Uh, but if I take negative 1 times row 1 and add it to row 2, this will be a 0. And then uh, negative 1 times this plus 2 is a 3. And then a negative 5. And then a 6. And on the bottom row, let's see, I'll be taking negative 3 times row 1 and adding it to row 3. This will be a 0. Uh, and then I get a plus 2. Negative 3 times negative 1 is 3. Add it to negative 1 is 2 and then negative 4, and then 2. Okay, so I've, uh, I've taken care of the first column, now I move to the second column. And if you remember, in this case, what I want to do is get a 1 in this position, and then zeros below it. I don't care about getting zeros above it. Uh, that'll come later in a different, in a, when we refer to a different episode. Well, to get a 1 here, it doesn't look like there's any easy, well, I think there is an easy way to get a 1. Let's take a negative 1 times row 3 and add it to row 2. That'll give me a 1. So let's do that. I'm going to take uh, row 2 and add on negative 1 times row 3. So my first row is 1, negative 1, 3, and 4. And then, let's see, the bottom row isn't going to change, so I'll rewrite that. But if I take negative 1 times 
row three and add it to row two, this would be a zero here, and I'll get a one there. That's what I was after. Uh, and then I'll get a negative one, and then a four. Now, the reason I'd like to get a one here is because I can use that as a lever to get a zero below it. So let's go ahead and do that right now. I'd like to get a zero right here, so I'm going to take row three and add on uh, negative two times row two. So row one doesn't change. And row two doesn't change. But row three changes dramatically. This becomes a zero and this becomes a zero. And uh, then I get a negative two here because that's a negative four. Let me emphasize that. And then um, negative six. Okay, now at this point, I'd like to get a one right there, but you know, I think I can step out right now and just solve for z. So I'm gonna write down my three equations. They say x minus y plus three z is four. And the second equation says that y minus z is equal to four. And the last equation, because I never got a, never got a one in that position, I have negative two z is equal to negative six. Well, we can see right here that that means z is equal to three. Okay, then I use back substitution to solve for y, and then I use back substitution to solve, solve for x. So I'm gonna back substitute right here to get y, and then I'll back, back substitute both of those to calculate x. And so it goes like this. y minus z is equal to four, and I know that z is equal to three. So y minus three is equal to four, which means y is equal to seven. And then if I substitute into the first equation, which is x minus y plus 3z is equal to 4, substituting in, I have uh, x minus 7 plus, let's see now, 3z would be 9 <coughs> is equal to 4. In other words, x plus 2 is 4, and so x is equal to 2. So my solution is uh, 2, 7, 3. So I'll write it as an ordered triple, 2, seven, three. And you notice when I listed, I listed in alphabetical order. Uh, now, if I were to substitute those back in just to check them, if I put a two here and a seven here and a three here, let's just see if those work out. Uh, this says that two minus seven is negative five. Negative five plus nine is four. In the second equation, two plus 14 is 16. 16 take away six is 10. That one checks. And six take away seven is negative one. Negative one plus 15 is 14. So it checks in all three, in all three equations. Uh, so this procedure is called uh, Gaussian elimination with uh, back substitution. And it's one of two significant methods that we, oh, back substitution here, I wrote the wrong word. Um, it's one of two methods that we've discussed in this, in this chapter for solving systems of equations. Let's take one more equation, and this time I want to pick one that has no solution. And I want to use Gaussian elimination to solve it. Now, as you might guess, the, the place where people generally make their mistakes in this procedure is just making simple arithmetic mistakes. I make simple arithmetic mistakes sometimes too. So uh, the trouble is, if you make a simple mistake like that, it can really throw off the problem and it, it can lead you to rather complex looking solutions like uh, uh, messy fractions and so forth. So not, not only is it the wrong answer, but you, you have to sometimes work even harder to get your answer than the answer that was actually intended. So you have to be careful about that. But uh, as long as you're proceeding in generally the right direction, you'll get some partial credit, even if you make an error along the way. Okay, in this next problem, I'd like to make up a situation where there's no solution, and let me show you how we can do that. Suppose I have the equation x plus y plus z equals one. I'll just make that one up at random. <coughs> uh, and actually, uh, the next equation then, I've, I've actually chosen to be x minus y plus two z is, um, let's say three. Now, to get a third equation, what I want to do is to combine these by subtraction. So what if I subtract these? x minus x is 0. y take away negative y, that'll be a 2y. <coughs> and 
and z take away 2z is minus z. And then what number should go over here? I guess negative 2? Well, instead of negative 2, I'm going to put something else in there. Let's say we pick uh, 10. You say, but if you subtract these, that shouldn't be 10. That should be negative 2. Well, because I've changed that number, there will be no solution because this is not the number that I should have gotten. Let's see what happens when I solve this, and I think we'll see that there's no solution in this problem. The augmented matrix will be 1, 1, 1, 1, and 1, negative 1, 2, 3, and 0, 2, negative 1, 10. Now, of course, just by looking at this, we wouldn't know that the answer is going to be no solution. But by the way we've made this up, I think we'll find out that there is no solution because we've, we've made an adjustment from what the answer uh, we would have expected. Well, I have a 1 in the first position again, so that certainly helps me. So I'd like to get a 0 here. So I'm going to take row 2 and add on negative 1 times row 1. So I get 1, 1, 1, 1. And I get uh, 0, negative 2. Uh, 1 and 2. And the bottom row is okay. I have a 0 right here. So this is 0, 2, negative 1, and 10. Okay, well, I'd like to get a, I'd like to get a, a 0 right there. Okay, but you know, uh, excuse me, I'd like to get a 1 right here. But what I'm noticing is if I, if I look further ahead, when I go to get a 0 here, I'll be adding row 2 to row 3. That'll be a 0. This will be a zero, and this one won't. So I'm going to jump ahead to the situation where, to the case where I want to get a zero uh, in the row three, column two position. So this is going to be, uh, let's see, I'll take row three and I'll add on row two. So the top row is one, 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 one. The second row is 0, negative 2, 1, 2. I've avoided getting the 1 there because it's going to introduce fractions, and I think the significant part of this problem is going to be what happens on the bottom row. So when I add rows 2 and 3, I get a 0, a 0, a 0, and uh, oh, I get a 12 when I add those. Well, the problem with this last equation is it says 0 equals 12. My equations are x plus y plus z is equal to 1. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that was my original equation. The second equation is negative 2y plus z is equal to 2. And the last equation says 0 equals 12. Well, that's a contradiction, of course. And by using elementary row operations, I know that I haven't destroyed the solution. I haven't changed the solution. So if there's no solution at the end, there was no solution at the very beginning. So this problem has no solution. Now, you could either stop right here and say no solution because of that contradiction. Or in some textbooks, you'll see they just write empty set for no solution. So um, in, in this case, we can stop early. We don't have to proceed to get a 1 here or anything else. As soon as you can get a contradiction within a row, then you're home free. OK, so much for that, for that problem. Let's go back to our uh, list of objectives in episode 22. And um, there's one more thing on there that I haven't haven't mentioned that we should, and that is the second item, be able to solve applications of systems of linear equations, uh, such as, for example, partial fractions. Now, you only saw me work one partial fraction problem uh, in class. There are many more in the, in the textbook, in the section on partial fractions. But uh, I think maybe we should perhaps take a partial fraction problem as another example. So I've picked out one here from the text, and it goes like this. Um, I'll just write it here on the board. Find the partial fraction decomposition of, um, let's see, 7x minus 3 over x times x plus 3 times x minus 1. OK, now, uh, first of all, let me remind you what I mean by a partial fraction decomposition. You see, if I have a, if I have an, if I have a fraction such as, uh, let's say, 5 over 6, uh, this denominator will factor. That's really 5 over 2 times 3. And this is a proper fraction because the numerator is smaller than the denominator. Now, whenever you have a proper fraction and the numerator will factor, 
you can break this up into two what are called partial fractions and I'm going to put these different factors in the denominators a half, halves, and thirds. And these two, these two expressions are called the partial fractions and I'm getting the partial fraction decomposition of 5 over 6. Now I'm looking for a numerator either positive or negative that makes this a, this a proper fraction and a numerator either positive or negative that makes this one a proper fraction so that this sum ends up being 5 6. And I think what I need is uh, 1 half and a 1 third. Let's see, 1 half is 3 over 6, 1 third is 2 over 6, and when you add those up, sure enough, you get 5 over 6. Now, as a matter of fact, this can always be done. This isn't a fact that's generally, uh, that you generally see, say, in, uh, in secondary school, because it has, not, it has no particular importance there, but the partial fraction decomposition does have some importance in some later courses. And it says if you have a proper fraction, and if the denominator factors, then you can write this in the form of, uh, well, because these are two different factors, two and three, uh, in the halves and thirds. The numerators might be negative uh, or positive, but they have to be proper fractions otherwise, and the sum adds up to be five over six. Now, with that idea, <coughs> let's, try the, let's try to find the partial fraction decomposition of seven x minus three over x times x plus three times x minus one. Now, you know, I, I should mention at the outset that in the textbook, these, these denominators are not always factored, and you may have to factor this on your own, like take out the common factor of x, and then you have a quadratic, which you factor in this case to be x plus 3 and x minus 1. Okay, so the proper uh, fraction, or the partial fraction decomposition will have an x, and an x plus 3, and an x minus 1. And this, this original expression is a proper fraction in the sense that I have a smaller degree on top than I have on bottom. On top I have a linear polynomial, first degree, and on the bottom I have a cubic polynomial if I multiply it out, so it's a proper fraction in the, in the sense of its degree. And so these will be proper fractions. And if the denominators have degree one, the numerators must be degree zero, which means they're constants. So I'll say A, B, and C. Those are all constants. I'd like to find out what constants I could put there that would make that sum be my original uh, expression. Well, to solve this, I'm going to multiply both sides by x times x plus 3 times x minus 1. And over here, I'll multiply by x times x plus 3 times x minus 1. And on the left-hand side, I'm left with only x minus 7x minus 3. On the right-hand side, when I multiply this quantity by those three factors, I get a times x plus 3 times x minus 1 plus b times x times x minus 1 plus c times x times x plus 3. Now, I'm going to make a comparison of the left side and the right side and see how many, what the constant term is on the right and compare it with negative 3, what the linear or first power term is on the right and compare it with 7, and what the quadratic term is, the square term on the right, and compare it with 0, because I have 0 x squares on the other side. But I'll need to multiply this out, so let's do that. 7x minus 3 is going to be a times x squared plus 2x minus 3 plus uh, if I multiply this out, it's bx squared minus bx. And then cx squared plus 3cx. Okay, now I still need to multiply through by a, so I have 7x minus 3 equals ax squared plus 2ax minus 3a plus bx squared minus bx plus cx squared plus 3cx. Now, I want to group all the x squares together, all the x's together, and all the constants together, and compare these two. So how many x squares will there be? Well, let's see, I have ax squared, I have bx squared, and cx squared, that's a plus b plus c. <coughs> how many x's do we have? First powers. Well, I have 2ax minus bx plus 3cx. So that says 2a minus b plus 3c. 
And now what's left over? There's only one constant term. This is what I'd call my constant term because a is representing some constant. We just don't know what it is yet. So that's a negative 3a. And if I compare, a plus b plus c must be 0 because over here on the other side I have 0 x squared. So a plus b plus c is 0. And in the second term, uh, 2a minus b plus 3z must be 7. 2a minus b plus 3c is 7. And finally, negative 3a is equal to negative 3. Well, that one I can solve quickly and see that a is equal to 1. So if a is equal to 1, uh, I have uh, 1 plus b plus c is 0. That says that b plus c is negative 1. And in the second equation, 2 minus b plus 3c is 7. So that says that negative b plus 3c is equal to 5. So I have two equations, this one and this one. Actually, I had three equations originally, but one of them was very easy to solve. So now I want to solve these two, and uh, I want to continue demonstrating Gaussian elimination with back substitution. So this is going to be fairly short, but let's solve those two equations, and I'll erase this and solve it up above. Now, you know, when you're solving a two-by-two two system of equations, any method you know of is probably going to be fairly short, and it may seem like this is overkill to use Gaussian elimination with back substitution to solve this, but since that's what you're being tested on, uh, I think that's what, that's what we ought to demonstrate. So we're solving b plus c is equal to negative 1, and negative b plus 3c is equal to 5. So what I'll do is convert that to matrix form, and that's 1, 1, negative 1, and then negative 1, 3, and 5. That's my so-called augmented matrix. Uh, I have a 1 in the first position. I want to get a 0 right below it, and I think we'll be home free. So I'm going to take row 2 and add on row 1. 1, 1, negative 1. Uh, adding, I get uh, 0, 4, and 4. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and divide through. Uh, so I'm going to multiply by 1 fourth. 1 fourth times row 2, and that's 1, 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay, and I now have this reduced to a form where I can back substitute. Okay, so our uh, system of equations is going to be b plus c is equal to negative 1 and c is equal to 1. Now you notice this first equation hasn't changed from what it was back up here. But if I back substitute for c, that says that b plus 1 is equal to negative 1, so b is equal to negative 2. Now if we put this together with the fact that we already found that a was equal to, um, let's see, what was a, I've forgotten here, oh, a was equal to 1, then what that tells me then is that the partial fraction decomposition of this original rational expression was going to be, let's say we said a over x plus b over x plus 3 plus c over x minus 1. Now a is equal to 1, b is equal to negative 2, and c is equal to 1. Which means if you add these three fractions together now, you'll have the original fraction. That is, if you add 1 over x minus 2 over x plus 3, so I, I bring the negative out in front, um, plus 1 over x minus 1. That's the partial fraction decomposition. Now, there are some courses that lie ahead, particularly if you're going to study mathematics, where you need to know about the partial fraction decomposition. So this is, I think, only our second example in the telecourse, but you'll find other examples in the textbook. Okay, let's go to episode 23. Um, in episode 23, we talked about using an alternative means of solving systems of equations called the Gauss-Jordan elimination method. Uh, this is where you get zeros both, uh, both above and below the diagonal of ones. Uh, I think we should take an example of that and uh, just see what are some of the nuances that come up when we solve that using the Gauss-Jordan elimination method. So 
This time we're using Gauss Jordan. Okay, I have a system of equations here that I've uh, picked out. Uh, let's solve x plus y plus z is equal to 2. And 2x minus 3y plus 2z is 4. And rather than adding or subtracting those equations, I have what you'd refer to as an independent equation. That is something completely different. And that is that 4x plus y minus 3z is equal to 1. And uh, this time I want to use the Gauss-Jordan method. Now on the, on the exam, if I don't specify which of these two matrix methods you should use, you can use either one that you feel most comfortable with. Uh, if you want to back substitute, you could use the, the first method. If you want to use Gauss-Jordan, there's, no Gauss, there's no back substitution involved, but there is a little bit more work in reducing uh, the matrix. If I specify the method, then of course you should, have, you should use that method completely. Okay, so the augmented matrix will be 1, 1, 1, and 2. And then 2, negative 3, 2 and 4. And then 4, 1, negative 3, 1. Now, uh, once again, I have a 1 in the row 1, column 1 position. And uh, of course, if there hadn't been a 1, if I could find a 1 somewhere else, I would interchange two rows to get a 1 up there. Otherwise, I'd find some way to add or subtract two rows, or even multiply through by a non-zero constant to get a 1. But that last, last option, I usually postpone until I have to use it, because if it introduces fractions, all the arithmetic gets, gets more complicated. But we have a 1, so let's just keep going. Um, I need to get zeros in the rest of the column. So I'll take row two and add on negative two times row one, and then I'll take row three and add on negative four times row one. But row one doesn't change. Uh, however, on the second row, I'll get a zero and a negative five, and a zero again, and a zero in the last position. On the bottom row, uh, I'll get a zero, and then I'll get um, negative three, and then I'll get negative seven, and then I'll get negative seven again. Now, you notice in this second row, uh, what this says is negative five y is equal to zero. So that tells me y is going to equal zero, but rather than stepping out and writing that down, I want to demonstrate the procedure. So I'm going to proceed as if I didn't realize that I could actually solve that equation just by looking at it. So let's just keep going. Now my goal after finishing the first column is to go to the second column and get a one in this position and then afterwards get zeros above and below it. So let's get a one right there first. And I can do that by multiplying by a negative one-fifth on row two. Row one hasn't changed here, and row three hasn't changed here, but row two does. Zero, one, zero, zero. And you see, the reason I want to get a one is I use it as a lever to produce the zeros below and above uh, so that I can continue. Well, to get a zero up above, I think I'll take row one and add on negative one times row two. That's going to be fairly easy because three of the four numbers there are zeros. And on the bottom row, I'll take row three, and I'll add on three times row two and to, pr to produce a zero right here. So let's do that. Uh, row two doesn't change. But row one becomes uh, one, zero, one, two. And row three becomes zero, zero, negative seven, negative seven. Okay, well, I've taken care of the first two columns. I come to the last column, and the first thing I do is get the one along the main diagonal, so I want to get a one right there. So I'll multiply by negative one-seventh, because I see that I'm not going to produce any fractions there. It's going to just uh, cancel out very nicely. So on top, I have one, zero, one, two. Then I have zero, one, zero, zero. And then I have zero, zero, one, one. Okay, I've almost finished. I still need to get a zero at the top of that column because I want only ones along the main diagonal. So to do, to accomplish that, I'll take row one and add on negative one times row three. That's a negative one right there. So um, let's see, the bottom row hasn't changed. 
And the second row hasn't changed, but the top row becomes 1, 0, 0, and 1. Well, you see, what's nice about the Gauss-Jordan method is although it takes me a few more steps to get the zeros above and below, I can just read the answers off. This says that x is equal to 1, it says that y is equal to 0, and it says that z is equal to 1. So my solution is 1, 0, 1. Most textbooks are going to write it this way because it takes up less space. Uh, let's just check these numbers and uh, see if they really do work. Now, I'm pointing this out because when you're doing this on an exam and you come up with your answer, you ha if you have time, go back and check your work, and you'll know if you got it right or wrong uh, by substituting it back in. So I have 1 plus 1 is 2. I have 2 plus 2 is 4. And I have 4 minus 3 is 1. So they all check. So that makes me think I've gotten the, the right answer here. Okay, one more example of gauss jordan and this time I want to work an example in which I'll get infinitely many solutions to show, to demonstrate how we parametrize the solutions. So uh, let's use the same method, different problem, and it should have a different outcome. What if, uh, what if we have a system of equations that looks like this. Uh, 2x plus y minus z equals, um, I'll just pick a number, let's say equals 3. And the second equation is x plus 2y plus 3z equals, um, let's say, uh, negative 5. Now for my third equation, since I want this to have infinitely many solutions, I want my third equation not to be independent, that is just to make it up separately from the others, but I want it to be a combination of the previous, of, of the previous equations. So what let's do is just subtract these. 2x minus x is x. y minus 2y is negative y. And negative z, take away 3z is negative 4z. And over here, 3 take away negative 5 is 8. Now, you remember when I made up the problem with no solution a few minutes ago? What I did is I changed that number so it didn't give me what I thought it was supposed to give. That gave me no solution. This time, I'm going to write down the answer as it actually turns out. Now, if I solve this, I think I'll get infinitely many solutions because, you see, this equation is not giving me any new information. It's just giving me a sort of a, a, uh, a compilation of what I already knew. So the augmented matrix is 2, 1, negative 1, 3. And then 1, 2, 3, negative 5. And then 1, negative 1, negative 4, 8. Now the trouble is when you look at a system of equations like this, or when you look at the augmented matrix, you don't recognize how it came about and that it's going to have infinitely many solutions. So you just have to proceed as usual. So let's continue as if we didn't know what's going to happen. Uh, I want to get a 1 in the first position. So why don't we interchange two rows? It doesn't matter which two. I'm going to interchange the first and the third. <coughs> so uh, I'm going to interchange the first and the third and rewrite number two. Now you might say, well, why aren't you interchanging rows one and two? Well, you could do that too, and uh, everything will work out fine. Now the first row becomes one, negative one, negative four, and eight. And the last equation is two, one, negative one, three. Okay, so if I continue uh, as usual, I want to get zeros in these positions uh, where the 1 and the 2 are. So row 1 won't change, but row 2 will. I'm going to take row 2 and add on negative 1 times row 1. And for row 3, I'll replace it with row, th row 3 plus negative 2 times row 1. So this becomes uh, 0, and then 3, and then 7, and then negative 13. And on the, second, on the third row, I'll get uh, 0, and then 3, and then 7, uh, and then negative 13. Now, do you notice anything unusual here? The last two rows are the same. Yeah, it looks like the last two rows are identical. So you see, if I just take row 2 and subtract it from row 3, I'll have all zeros across the bottom. So let's do that. I'm going to take uh, row 3 and add on negative 1 
times row two. So row one is one, negative one, negative four, and eight. Row two hasn't changed. It's zero, three, seven, and negative 13. And now if when I take negative one times row two and add it to row three, I get zero, 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 and zero. Now, when I get all zeros across here, this is not a contradiction. This says zero equals zero. It just means there's no new information there. I knew that zero was equal to zero before I ever started the problem. So all the information comes from the first two equations. And you can see now why this is happening because of the way we designed this. So um, let's see, one more step. If I get a one right here, this won't be pretty, but it looks like I'll just have to divide through by three or multiply by a one third. So let's do that. One third times row two. Now let's see, row one is still uh, as it has been. Row three is the same. But on row two, in order to get that one, I have to go to fractions and I get zero, one, seven thirds, and negative 13 thirds. And then because I'm using Gauss Jordan elimination, I want to get a zero up above. So let's do that. I think it's going to be worth the arithmetic to see this answer. I'm going to take row one and add on row two. Row two is this. And row three looks like that. So on row one, it's going to become one, zero. Now let's see, when I add negative four and seven thirds, negative 12 thirds plus seven thirds is negative five thirds. And then this is 24 thirds, and I'm adding on negative 13 thirds gives me 11 thirds. Okay, so what can, I, what can I get from that? Well, let me erase this upper part. Maybe this will be enough. And let's write down what this augmented matrix says. It says that x minus 5 thirds z is equal to 11 thirds. And the second equation says that y plus 7 thirds z is equal to negative 13 thirds. Now, solving for x, it looks like x is equal to 11 thirds plus 5 thirds z. And y is equal to negative 13 thirds minus 7 thirds z. So I have x, I have y, the only thing left I need is z, and z is equal to z. I mean, that's, uh, that's certainly true. So now I have x, y, and z defined in terms of z. So on the right-hand side, z is referred to as a parameter because if you know the value of that parameter, you can calculate the value of our three unknowns. Now, in some textbooks, they'll write this answer as 11 thirds plus 5 thirds z negative 13 thirds minus 7 thirds z and z. And in other books, they'll change the parameter to a different letter, usually t, and they'll write this answer as 11 thirds plus 5 thirds t, negative 13 thirds minus 7 thirds t, and then t. Either form of the answer is perfectly fine with me, but uh, I do want you to isolate all three variables, x, y, and z, and then write this in the form of an ordered triple as your answer. And of course, what this means is as you pick different values of z or t, if you plug in zero or one or two, you generate infinitely many solutions for the original system of equations. But rather than doing that, I think we ought to move on. So let's go to episode 24 and look at some things you need to know in that next episode. First of all, you should be able to perform matrix arithmetic. Now, what I mean by that is you should be able to add matrices of the appropriate dimensions. You should be able to subtract them. You should be able to multiply by scalars. Uh, keep in mind that you can only add and subtract matrices if they have exactly the same dimensions. If they don't have the same dimensions, then we just say that the answer is undefined. <coughs> now, you should be able to compute the inverse uh, of an invertible matrix by beginning with the matrix of the form A, I, and reducing it to I, A inverse. I think maybe we better take an example of that because that's, uh, there's a lot involved in those words. Uh, suppose I have this matrix. Matrix A, let's make it a two by two. Matrix A is uh, three, four, two, and uh, three. Three, four, three, four, two, three. And I'd like to find A inverse 
if it exists. Now you remember not every matrix has an inverse, not even every square matrix has an inverse. If it has an inverse, then matrix A is said to be non-singular, uh, or matrix A is said to be invertible. Now to find A inverse, what I do is I set up not a two by two matrix, but a two by four matrix, two rows, four columns. I put matrix A on the left, and I put the identity matrix on the right. Now matrix A, is 3, 4, 2, 3. And the identity matrix is 1, 0, 0, 1. So then what I do is proceed to convert this into the identity matrix. And when I get the identity matrix here, if I get the identity matrix here, then A inverse will come up on the other side. If there is no A inverse, then what will happen is I won't be able to produce the identity matrix on the left-hand side. So that's my goal. And first of all, I want to get a 1 right here. Of course, one way to do it would be to multiply through by one-third, but then I'd get fractions. So why don't we take row one and add on the negative of row two. So row one, add on negative one times row two, and the three and the, and the two, I think, will give me a difference of one. So the bottom row doesn't change, but the top row does. Uh, so this will be a one, four, Adding on negative 3 is a 1. 1 adding on a 0 is 1. And then negative 1 goes here. OK, so I have a 1 there. I want to get a 0 in this position. And to do that, I think I'll take row 2 and add on negative 2 times row 1. So row 1 hasn't changed. And row 2 becomes a 0 and 1 and negative 2, and 3. Well, that's good. I have a 1 here, so now I can use that to, to, to uh, produce a 0 up above it. So let's take row 1 and add on negative 1 times row 2. So this, this looks a lot like Gaussian elimination and gauss jordan elimination, but we're computing the inverse of a matrix. Uh, let's see, now I'm subtracting row 2 from row 1, so that'll be a 1 and a 0, and a 3, and um, a negative 4. A negative 4. Now you notice this is the identity on the left-hand side, which means this must be the inverse of A on the right-hand side. So when we said calculate A inverse if it exists, we now have an answer for A inverse, and it is this 2 by 2 matrix. It's 3, negative 4, negative 2, and 3. Now, how could I check that to see if it really is the, the uh, identity matrix? Well, I could multiply those two together and see if it gives me the identity when I multiply. So let's do that right here. And uh, that is A inverse, well, excuse me, A inverse times A is... 3, negative 4, negative 2, and 3, multiplied by 3, 4, 2, and 3. And we get 9, take away 8 is 1. And we get 12, take away 12 is 0. And we get negative 6 plus 6 is 0. And we get negative 8 plus 9 is 1. Yes, that is the identity matrix. And if you multiply in the reverse order, I won't work that out but you'll end up getting the identity matrix again that way. So we've calculated the inverse of a matrix uh, using uh, matrix methods. Okay, let's look again at episode uh, 24 and see what we're after here. We've just reduced uh, a matrix to get its inverse. So the next thing is be able to solve a matrix equation of the form AX equals B using the inverse matrix. Well, I think we can use this as an example right here. So coming back to this board, we have a matrix A and we've already computed its inverse. So what if I wanted to solve this system of equations? 3X plus 4Y equals 10 and 2X plus 3Y equals 19. Now, I don't know what the solution for this is going to be because I just made up two numbers to go on the end here, but I want to convert this into a matrix equation of the form A times X 
equals b. Now this would be the coefficient matrix, and this would be the variable matrix, and this is the constant matrix. So the, the coefficient matrix is 3, 4, 2, 3. And the unknown matrix that I've called x here is actually the columnar matrix with my two variables in it, x and y. And that should equal my constant matrix on the other side, which is 10 and 19. Now you, you see this, this multiplication is defined because this is 2 by 2, and this matrix is 2 by 1. And when I multiply, those two numbers are the same. So I can multiply, and the answer is 2 by 1. And this is a 2 by 1 matrix over here. And the way that I go about solving this is I multiply both sides by A inverse. And you remember for this A, I've calculated A inverse already. So this is A inverse times A times X equals A inverse B. And A inverse times A is the identity matrix. And that tells me that the way you get x is you take a inverse times b. So the way I solve for x here is I multiply a inverse times b. So a inverse times b. Now a inverse we calculated back here is the matrix 3, uh, negative 4, negative 2, and 3. And I'll multiply it by matrix b. Matrix b is the constant matrix. 10, 19. And that's going to give me 30 take away 76. Looks like I came up with some fairly big numbers here. 30 take away 76 is negative 46. And then I have negative 20 plus 57 is 37. Wow, so I came up with some big values for x and y. Um, so x should be negative 46 and y should be 37. And if you substitute these numbers in, you should get 10, and here you should get 19. But rather than checking that all out, I think I'll move on to a different example. But once you know the inverse, you can solve a system of linear equations that has a unique solution by just taking the inverse times b, times, times b as we've worked out over here. OK, uh, let's go back to episode uh, 24. And this says, uh, you should know a special formula that allows you to write quickly the inverse of an invertible 2 by 2 matrix. You know, I don't think I ever mentioned this in class, so I'm not actually going to expect you to know this, but if you want to use it, you can. Uh, and that is for a 2 by 2 matrix, um, let's say for a 2 by 2 matrix of this form, A, B, C, D, uh, the inverse, if the inverse exists, it can be calculated by, first of all, uh, switching A and D. So you put D up here and you put A down below. And the B and C, you don't move them, but you change their sign, negative B and negative C. And then you have to multiply this by a constant, and it's 1 over AD minus BC. Now, I didn't justify this formula in class. Uh, because actually the justification is a little bit messy. It takes up a little bit of time. So let me just say that if you want to use this formula, you can on the exam. Uh, but I won't expect you to know the formula. Instead, if you want to find the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix, you can use matrix methods like we've just seen in the last example to find its inverse. OK, let's go to episode 26. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 25. And in episode 25, uh, you should be able to evaluate determinants of all sizes using expansion by cofactors along any row or column. And then there is a simple formula for evaluating two by two determinants as well. Let's take some examples of both of these. First of all, if you have a two by two determinant, for a two by two, I'll just fill in some numbers here like five, three, negative four, and negative six. Now, to evaluate a 2 by 2 determinant, you take 5 times negative 6 and then subtract off 3 times negative 4. And that'll give you the value of the determinant. That's going to be negative 30 plus 12, and that's 18. 
Now the way we explain this in class is what we're doing is we're taking five times its cofactor, this is its cofactor, and then we're taking uh, three times its cofactor, which requires a sign change uh, before we add that up. But the shortcut is to take this product minus this product. It would be negative 18 though. Oh, a negative 18, thank you, yeah, negative right there. Now for larger determinants, let's take an example of a three by three. Um, suppose the first row is four, one, two, and then three, zero, five, and then two, and uh, seven, and negative four. Now, in this case, what I can do is expand on any row or column, and I think I'd want to pick the row or the column that has a zero in it to save me a little bit of, uh, a little bit of effort. So let's expand along the, the middle row. I'll just circle it. And, you know, three is in a negative position, so I'll just put a negative out in front, and then I multiply it by the determinant one, two, seven, negative four. You remember what we do is we remove the row and the, uh, and the column that the three is in. Then I move to the zero. Zero's in a positive position, but I'm not gonna bother writing down the, the two by two determinant that goes with zero because the product will be zero. Then I'll move to the five. Five's in a negative position. And the two by two determinant is four, one, two, seven. Okay, now I'll evaluate these by just expanding the two by two determinants. That's negative three times uh, negative four minus 14 plus zero minus five times 28 minus two. So this gives me negative three times negative 18 minus five times 26. Well, I just omitted the zero since it's irrelevant now. So this gives me 54 minus 130, and that's going to be uh, negative 76. Now, what would be the answer if I'd expanded along any other row or column? What answer should I get? The same thing. We, we ought to get the same thing, of course. So um, uh, you, you can pick any row or column, but I think you'd want to choose the, choose the one that has the most zeros to save you a little bit of work in calculating that cofactor. Okay, uh, back to episode 25. Know the effect of each of the three elementary row and column operations on the value of a determinant. Now let me just mention this quickly, that if you interchange two rows or if you interchange two columns of a determinant, you change the sign of the determinant. If it had been negative 76 before, it'll be positive 76 afterwards. If you multiply a single row or a single column by a constant, let's say if you multiply by three, what that does is to triple the value of the determinant. And then finally, if you take a multiple of one row and add it to another row, surprisingly, that has no effect on the value of the determinant. So um, those, are the, those are the effects of the three elementary row operations. Now, Kramer's rule. Let's come back to the board here and let me just remind you how Kramer's rule works. If you have uh, a system of equations, I'll make up a short one here. 2x plus y is 7, and 5x minus 3y is um, 12, let's say. Uh, this could have been a 3 by 3, or a 4 by 4, or a larger system of equations, but if I want to solve this to get, uh, to, to get x and y, first of all, I calculate determinant d, which is just the coefficient determinant, 2, 1, 5, negative 3. Then I calculate a determinant d sub x where you replace the x column with these constants. So that's going to be 7, 12, 1, negative 3. And then for d sub y, I go back to the original coefficient determinant and I replace the y column with the constants. So the 2 and the 5 return and the 7 and the 12 appear over here. Now, we actually justified this procedure using the effect of elementary row and column operations on determinants, but to calculate x, you take the ratio of d sub x over d, this one over that one, and to calculate y, you take d sub y over d. And if this had been, a, say, a three by three system of equations, then what I would do would be to have a d sub x, d sub y, and d sub z, where those individual columns have been replaced, and I divide each of those by d to get the value.
Now, if it turns out that this problem should have no solution or infinitely many solutions, so there's no one solution to generate, what'll happen is this determinant will be zero and it won't allow me to divide, and so I won't be able to uh, come up with an answer. So uh, if D turns out to be zero, it tells you you have infinitely many or no solution for the problem. Okay, in episode 26, uh, things you need to be able to do. Uh, you should be able to solve systems uh, of equations that include nonlinear equations, and you'd probably want to use the substitution or the elimination method. Now, I'm not referring to Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan elimination, but I'm referring to the, the typical substitution and elimination methods you've seen in Math 1010. Uh, when I say nonlinear equations, what I mean is something like this. Suppose we knew that x squared plus y squared is equal to 4, and that y is equal to x plus 2. I'm just making this up, so I have no idea what the solution is. But you see, here's a linear equation, but that's a nonlinear equation because there, there are squares involved. So I think probably the substitution method would be the way to proceed on this. Um, okay, back to episode 26. You should also be able to graph the solution of a set of uh, a system of inequalities in two unknowns. So you would graph those on the xy plane. You might be graphing circles, parabolas, diagonal lines, vertical, horizontal lines, etc. But you should be able to graph systems and shade in the appropriate region. And then finally, uh, you may have a problem involving linear programming. And if you remember, uh, linear programming involves graphing a system of inequalities and then maximizing or minimizing the objective function or the subject function by using the, the vertices of the graphed um, solution set. Okay, well I think that covers everything that uh, you'll need to know in episode 26. Now obviously, I can't ask you all these things on this exam. There's just too much. Some of these problems take quite a bit of time to work, uh, as you've seen. But uh, I'll be selecting from these things, and to be prepared, you should know how to do all of these. Hey, best of luck to you on this exam, and I'll see you afterwards for episode 28.